Tom Henry, over 50 years in the electrical industry. IBEW apprenticeship completed in 1960. Diesel locomotive electrician. Residential, commercial, and residential master electrician. Supervisor of skilled trades Walt Disney World. Certified electrical instructor. Certified chief electrical inspector. Author of 44 books, 41 videos, and 15 audios. President of Code Electrical Classes Incorporated. President of Tom Henry's Learn to Be an Electrician Training Program. Instructor of over 20,000 electricians preparing for the exam. Electrical expert in personal injury and death cases. Author of the Informer, the Electrician's Newsletter. Member NFPA, member IAEI. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Module E1, Electron Theory. It's important that the student have a clear understanding of the scientific nature of electricity before we ever install an electrical circuit. What happens is you can't see electricity. It's an invisible force. And that's where these videos are going to be so powerful and so instrumental in understanding electricity because we can show it in motion and you'll be able to better understand its behavior. Now to clearly understand this mysterious force called electricity, you must start at the very beginning and it's called electron theory. You see, planet Earth is, is a huge magnet. I mean, it has a North Pole and a South Pole it's made up of matter. See, matter is considered anything that you can see or touch. It has a weight. It takes up space. Uh, like this pencil here on my desk. Uh, weight, space, or the paper. Uh, matter could be a, a gas or it could be a liquid like water. But what happens is when we break matter down into its smallest microscopic parts, then we have what's called atoms. Now see, matter is not electricity, nor are atoms electricity, but atoms are the source of electricity. Oh, there's over a hundred atoms. You may have heard of atoms like, say, oxygen or nitrogen or hydrogen. In our studies to be an electrician, we're gonna hear words like atoms of copper, aluminum, uh, silver, lead. But see, although there's only a hundred atoms, there's the materials. When we combine these materials to produce molecules, like two atoms can be combined and we make a molecule of material. Example, H2O equals water. You've probably all seen that, but H is like hydrogen. We have two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen combined makes water. But here's the neat part. Hydrogen is a gas and oxygen is a gas. But when we take these two gases, atoms, and make a molecule of liquid, water. Okay. Now, a molecule is the smallest particle that a compound can be reduced before it breaks into atoms. If we broke a grain of salt in half, and in half again, and again, and it could still be recognized as salt, well, if we kept breaking it down into its smallest microscopic form, then we would have atoms of chlorine and sodium. They combine them, you make a molecule of salt. Now, an atom it's the smallest particle on planet Earth. Like in my hand right now, I, I could have over a billion atoms of oxygen, air. But see, what's important, an atom contains three subatomic particles. The protons and the neutrons 
are located in the center of the atom. This is called the nucleus. Now the electron, it spins around the nucleus in orbit, like a solar system, as you can see in the picture, like the sun. The proton is positive, the neutron is a neutral. The electron is the spinning negative going around this. The heavier proton is bound to the nucleus. It is permanent. Since the electrons are lighter, they orbit, as you can see, around the nucleus with their negative charges. Their centrifugal motion is what keeps them bound. Now, the nucleus may have over 30 particles, but only two are important, the proton and the neutron. And really, only one is important to electricity in the nucleus. It's the proton. Okay. Now, the number of protons in the nucleus determines how atoms differ from each other. As you can see in the picture, copper has 29 protons, whereas aluminum only has 13 protons. You see, only the electron participates in the flow of electricity. It is so important in our study of electricity to first learn the force that the electron has. And when we learn about this force, then we'll learn the respect that electricity deserves. See, atom is a Greek word meaning indivisible. But we have split the atom in 1945 with the atomic bomb. Today, we split the atom in the use of nuclear energy to our advantage. But see, the point is, the, the electron is such a very, very small, but yet it has such a tremendous force. Uh, in the module that you'll be reading, your textbook, uh, they talk about the electron weighing 70 thousandths of an inch, and it's a negative, and how it repels, and so on. I'd like to do a demonstration. I've taken two pieces of paper, and I've tried to get the weight of an electron. I marked these with a minus, a negative, to show you that they're both negatives. And here's what they're saying in your textbook. The 0.39 inches would be like the width of a pencil. So if we took this pencil and bet put between these two electrons, 0.39 inches apart, to show you the force that an electron has by being that far apart, and trying to push together to where they touch, to push them that far, would take the weight of all the water in all the oceans of the world. That's the strength of repulsion of an electron. See, the advantage of this video is you can read text, you can see it on video. But when you take the text and the video and you combine them together, then you've made a molecule of understanding. Now, the picture shows that hydrogen is the lightest atom. It only has one proton, where carbon has six. Now, electrons don't fall into the nucleus, even though the nucleus is positive and the electron is a negative. As you can see, the centrifugal force keeps the electron spinning. Electrons orbit in shells. Each shell has a definite capacity of electrons. Hydrogen. Well, hydrogen has one shell, carbon two shells. See, the outer shell is the valence shell. Now, the outer shell is what we're interested in for electricity. It's easier to dislodge an electron because it's farther from this positive in the nucleus. The farther we get out on this valence, and the farther we are away from this magnetic attraction. So out here on the valence is where we find this easier electron to free. Now the next picture is going to show aluminum has 13 positive protons in the nucleus and 13 negative electrons orbiting in three shells around the nucleus. The shell orbiting closest to the nucleus has two electrons. 
the middle orbiting shell has a late electrons, and the outermost shell, the valence, has three orbiting electrons. Now in the next picture, we're going to look at copper. See, copper will be a little different. Now copper will have 29 positive protons in the nucleus and 29 negative electrons orbiting in four shells around the nucleus. The shell orbiting closest to the nucleus has two electrons. The next shell outward has eight orbiting electrons. Now the third outward shell has 18 electrons and the outermost shell, the valence, has one orbiting electron. Now to free an electron from this shell, this valence shell, it takes force. And in our studies, we're going to learn about friction, magnetism, heat, pressure, light, chemical, like a battery, to free this electron. Now see, the best conductor, say like a copper wire that you use to wire your house with, the best conductor, the valence, will have one, two, or three electrons out on that shell. Now, one electron on the valence is the best conductor. Copper. Copper has one electron on the valence. See how this applied energy hits that and frees it, knocks it right off? Well, see, aluminum has three out there. It's not as good because this applied energy has to divide up three ways to knock it off. Okay. Now, insulators. See, insulation is put around an electrical wire to keep the electricity in it. Just like you would with water. Water has a pipe. We put that pipe around that water so it won't leak. Well, we're doing the same thing with this electricity. We put an insulation around it so it won't leak. Now, six or more valence electrons is a good insulator. Stable with eight. See, an atom with seven is most active as it's trying to catch a free electron. A stable atom has eight, and the best insulator has seven. Now an ion, ION, is an atom or molecule that has become unbalanced by either losing or gaining electron. Electron lost is positive, gained a negative. Ionization does not change the chemical makeup of an atom but it does produce an electrical charge. Now the picture will show the law of electrical charges is positives repel each other. Negatives. Negative charge repels each other. But you take the unlikes, positive negatives, they attract each other, as you can see. Attraction. I have on my desk a pair of horseshoe magnets, which one time or another we've all used. But see, if I take a positive and a positive and a negative and a negative, it, they repel one another. It makes it difficult to push those together. And if I would take the magnet and turn it over to where I have a positive and a negative and a positive and a negative, see how they attract? There's the magnetic attraction. So what we want to learn in our, our studies of magnetism the repulsion and the attraction is that negatives, like the negative electron, as we learned earlier, two negatives repel. Two positives repel. But when we take the positive and the negative, then we have this attraction. And we'll be talking about this more throughout our videos on motors and magnetism and transformers. Just remember that energy excites the atom causing the electrons to break away and go join another atom. See, like a boxing glove. That boxing glove comes along as the energy to hit that free electron and knock it over to join another atom. Right? Now, static electricity. We've all experienced that by combing your hair or Say walking across the carpet. You ever walk across the carpet and stick the key in a metal doorknob? Watch how this guy goes. Up. 
or putting the key in the car when you slide across the seat covers or on a dry day in the winter. Have you, have you ever, uh, in a dark room, taken your nylon sweater off and you see the sparks fly? Well, that's when two different materials are rubbed together and electrons are being discharged by friction. See, one atom is joining another atom. A lightning is an example of static electricity. See, it is generated from the friction between a cloud and the surrounding air. We have a friction there from the positive to the negative, and from the negative to the positive. Did you know that lightning can occur during a snowstorm? Lightning can occur in a sandstorm? And lightning can travel from Earth to the clouds? Now, static electricity is stored up at rest. It, it does no work. For, for electricity to do work, it must flow. It's got to have a motion. Now, when it's in motion, it's called current. And current is when many electrons in a conductor move in the same direction like a flow of water. Okay? A free electron moves in random matter throughout the conductor and it still is attracted to an atom. When free electrons move randomly in all directions that are undirected action does not produce any useful results. To get electrons to flow in one direction, we do this by connecting the wire to a source of energy. Uh, to make current flow, you must be a, a difference of potential. Electrons actually travel through the wire at a low speed. But the impulse, I mean, the impulse is as fast as the speed of light. When a difference in potential exists between two charged bodies, electrons will flow along the wire. In the picture, water tanks. When the valve is open, the water flows as there is a potential of difference. And the water will continue to flow until there is no flow, no difference of potential. They're equal. Now a battery, a battery has an excess amount of electrons on its negative terminal. The other electrode is positive, and it doesn't have as many, and it's looking for some more electrons to come over to it. This is called a difference of potential. The electrons actually travel through a solution. This is called a chemical reaction as they flow from the negative over to the positive electrode. What I'd like to do now on the video is uh, we'll take a few minutes and I'd like to show you some real interesting experiments that we've put together. I mean, where you'll actually see electron movement. You'll see current flowing in motion. I mean, just some outstanding shots we have close up. What I'm going to do here, we've had the camera zoom in on my desk. I have a, a potato, and I'm going to do what we call the potato experience to show the chemical reaction that we have in electricity flow. Now what I'll do, I've got a, a couple of shiny pennies, and I'll take uh, my knife, and I'm going to cut a couple of small slits in the potato itself. And we'll keep these slits uh, maybe a quarter of an inch apart. Now, I'm going to take this power source. I have a, a little 9-volt battery here. And we're going to take this battery, and we'll connect it to these pennies, insert it in the potato, and we'll just see what happens. It'll take a few minutes, but we'll see what happens in this experiment. Now, as you can see, I've taken the two pennies and I, I've inserted them into the potato. I've run the red positive from the battery, the black negative from the battery to the other penny. This is a 9-volt battery. So what we actually have, we have a circuit from the battery to the penny through the potato to the other penny. You can't see it, but as I look closely, the potato juice on the penny is, is starting to bubble now. It's, uh, it's showing that there is a flow through the potato. What I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this in this position for a few minutes, 
and we'll come back and, and check our experiment to see what happens. Now I've had the battery connected to the potato, to the pennies, for 10 minutes. So let's see. Can you notice right in here the dark area? That's, that's the juice from the potato. The chemical reaction is actually flowing out of this penny here. Uh, I'll take, pull this penny out. It still looks pretty shiny the negative, the black wire. When I pull out the positive, you can see the positive, how it's discolored, about half of it. See the discoloration? It is flowing from positive to the negative. Now you can get a good view of the juice that's run from the potato right in this area. So as we can see, we had a chemical reaction flowing through the potato with a 9-volt battery. Now the next uh, experiment that I have, I've used some distilled water and I poured this glass so oh, three-fourths of the way full. Now I have a ohmmeter, voltmeter that later in our modules we'll learn about instruments and meters and learn more about it. What now I have this meter set where if I take the leads and touch them together, see how the, the meter moves all the way over? See the needle movement as I touch these two probes together? Now this experiment is going to show when I put these two probes into the water, this is distilled water, you notice the meter does not move. Now, that is called continuity. It means it has no path in the water from one lead to the other. I mean, this, this meter has a small battery that would show movement when I touch them together as such. See it moving? Now watch. In the water. We're going to learn later that water can be very dangerous in, in the uses of electricity, like we try to avoid putting electrical wires in water. And what we're talking about now is we have very clean distilled water. Now, if I take this very clean distilled water, I get this little packet of salt. Let's put some salt in here. We'll kind of, we'll kind of mess the water up a little bit. I've got another little packet. We'll put some more salt in here. So we've taken this very nice water. I mean, I'm going to take a little uh, vinegar. I'm going to pour some vinegar into our glass of distilled water. Let's take this thing and we'll stir it up a little bit. This is called a solution. We're going to stir this up, our salt, vinegar, and our water. We'll see what happens now. Now remember, when I touch the leads together, I show continuity through the meters. The needle is moving. Let's see what happens now when we put our meter in this water. Look at this. As I put either probe in here, see the needle moving now? Before, with the distilled clean water, we had no movement. When it's very pure. But look now. Now here is what we call a complete path. In other words, all of a sudden, the water now becomes dangerous when used with electricity. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take a, the 9-volt battery and we'll zoom in and I'm going to take this 9 volt battery and put these leads down in our solution. Can you see the negative wire? Can you see the bubbles forming? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? See it going? There is current flow through a solution. You have voltage going from one electrode of the battery 
flowing to the other. You can see the flow right through this water. In this experiment here, I'm going to take, I have here on the table, I have 12 pennies and 12 dimes. You can, you can use 10 or 20 or the amount, the more coins you would use, the, the greater uh, voltage you could get. What, what I'm going to do with this experiment, I'm going to show you how to take two different coins, two different metals, and I'll, I'll use this glass. We'll use this same glass that had some vinegar and salt in it. We'll use that as our solution base. And I'll take uh, this piece of towel, and I'm going to cut little pieces of it. And I'll, I'll soak them in the salt and vinegar water, and I'll put a piece of towel between the penny and between the dime. You'll see here in a moment, we're going to make a stack. Now, we'll set our meter to read DC voltage. And you'll see in a moment, when I put the meter on the stack of pennies and dimes, it will have a current flow through this stack. And this is the same thing as making a battery. This is a real neat experiment. As you can see, I've taken the 12 pennies and the dimes. You want to make sure they're clean. And I've taken and cut little pieces of paper and I've soaked them in this water solution. I put a piece of paper between each penny and each dime. Now whichever one you start with, in this case I started with a penny, you want to finish with the dime on top. Now I've set the meter to read voltage, DC voltage. I've got it on a two and a half volt scale, which means if the needle moves all the way across, I'd have two and a half volts. So I'm going to put my black probe here, and let's see if we have any voltage. Isn't that amazing? Look at that needle move. When I touch this dime on top, I'm showing a current flow through this stack of coins. Almost a half a volt, not quite. Now naturally, the more coins you would use, the bigger you make it, the more voltage you would read. What we're trying to do in this experiment is show that current flows through dissimilar metals. See, in a battery, if you, if you broke a battery apart, you'll find two electrodes, a positive and negative, which are made of different metals. So that one gives up its electrons and the other receives it through this solution, and this is known as the battery, a chemical reaction. What I have laying on the desk now is two short pieces of wire, uh, the first one being an aluminum wire, which Later in your work as an electrician, you'll be using aluminum, and the other is the more popular copper conductor. We learned earlier in this video, and in our module, we'll learn that when we talk about different materials, that they have different atoms. And you remember that the copper had 29 atoms, whereas the aluminum had 13 atoms. So each one of these pieces of wire have different atoms. Now the point we're trying to make here is if you take two dissimilar metals and connect them together, you have electron flow. Now I have the meter setting on the same two and a half volts. I'm going to connect uh, one lead to the copper and I'll put it in the solution. I'm going to connect the other lead to the aluminum and watch what happens as I put it in the solution. See the meter rise? We have over one half volt flowing through our solution. This is the same solution we used earlier with the salt and the vinegar, which makes a conductive path between the two different alloys. We actually have current flow. The electrons are moving 
from the one metal to the other. Later, in our studies of electricity, in our wiring methods, we'll learn that we don't want to connect copper and aluminum together without using a, a solvent, a, a, they call it a pentrox. And what this does, it, it keeps it from oxidizing. And you've just seen here why it oxidizes. Because you have a current flow, even though it's minimal, you have a current flow between two dissimilar metals. As you can see, as the meter moves, the current is moving. What I've done, let's take this solution and we'll set it aside. I found a, a lemon. And I, I want to show you an experiment here. I'm going to take this same aluminum with this probe on it, and I'm going to stick it down, or we'll work it down inside this lemon, and I'm going to take the copper wire, and watch what happens when I put it in the lemon. Will you actually see the meter? I'll, I'll take this lead off. Watch it when I touch it. See the meter moving? Through this lemon, we have current flow. Why? Well, we have two dissimilar metals. It's going through an acid in the lemon, a solution, just like it did with the water when we put salt and vinegar in it. So when we make a solution and we have two dissimilar metals where electrons can travel from one, like one's giving up the electrons, the other one's receiving them, then we have a motion. It's a voltage potential of difference. Now the different forms of electricity are piezoelectricity. Oh, as you see it's how it's spelled and see how it's pronounced, it's it's piezoelectricity. And this is a Greek word for pressure. We we use it in sound crystals and microphones and phonographs and this. Now another form is heat. Now we can take two dissimilar metals and heat them and we actually put off some metal bolts. Uh, we use this in uh, thermal electricity, like in thermocouples in the industry. Light, you've all heard of the solar collectors that we pick up light through photons. And we've talked about in this video the friction and the static and the chemical, the battery you've seen in the demonstrations. But the most widely form of energy electrically is magnetism. That's the spinning of the generators and the dynamos and that, that'll be covered later in a in a separate module. I mean in this module, I mean it's so exciting. We'll actually go to Niagara Falls and, and, and we'll see the first hydro plant and we'll talk about Nikola Tesla and we'll we'll go up into Canada east of Toronto and we'll take a tour of a hydro plant and we'll see the fossil fuel the coal burning plants and we'll see how these big generators are turned to make this magnetism and to make our electrical energy see we must have a form of energy to make this electron move as you've seen in the demonstrations and when an electron moves through a conductor a current will flow Okay. Electrons don't come into contact with each other. We saw earlier electrons are negatives in, in the strength of their repulsion. See, electrons move the, <clears throat> the same time and they move rapidly. I mean, there's billions of these free electrons in the wire. While the impulse travels near the speed of light as the, as the electrons bump into each other. See, a, a single, one single electron, it, it's been said that that single electron, it only moves about three inches in an hour. Where electrons actually move at the speed of light, like 186,000 miles a second. If you want to relate to that, that's like going from New York to Honolulu uh, 13 times in one second. Now see what happens, it's kind of like pool balls. If you had a string of pool balls lined up and that first pool ball come in and it hit that very first one and it bumps the next one and the next one and the next one. Well see that first pool ball didn't move too far. But way down there on the end of these string 
that last pool ball jumped out of there. And that's what we call the impulse of the electron. And it's at the speed of light very quickly. Now, what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about some words. We're going to start getting used to words that we're going to be using throughout our electrical training. And words that you may or may not have heard, like volts and amps and resistance and watts. Your next module, E2, is going to cover this thoroughly. But right now, we need to just start dipping into them so that we start understanding what the word means. And as we said earlier on this video, now electricity, you can't see it. It's an invisible force. Myself, I have a part-time job with a law firm as an electrical expert. And sometimes when we have to testify in these cases, and you're confronted with a jury, and the jury comprises of housewives or bankers or people that aren't familiar with the electrical words such as resistance or watts and so on. What we do in these cases is what I'm going to do in this video with you. Since we can't see electricity, we're going to use the water analogy. Because we can see water, it's a liquid. And this is the way I was taught. See, the very beginning, the source, the mover, to water, it's like a water pump. Electricity, this will be our generator. The water pipe that carries the water through it will be our wire. The pressure, like the pump has a pressure to force this water through the pipe. In electricity, we call that voltage. And then as the water travels through the pipe or through the hose and it comes out the ends, we have a flow. In water, they call it gallons per minute. Electricity, we call this amperage. Now, as this pipe travels, say, say we had a pipe that was two inches in diameter. And all at once we reduce that two inch pipe, say maybe down to a one inch or even a half inch pipe. Well, with water, that's a restriction. In other words, as that water comes, oh, now it's being slowed down. Electrically, we'll call that our resistance, see? To the point, we'll even go more in depth as you go through your different modules. The water coming down, say, to hit a wheel, to turn something, like a paddle wheel, as it turns. We'll see, as this water is following, this wheel, as it hits it, is offering what we call an opposition. Now, as that water turns this wheel, now there's going to be work being done. We may have it turn a generator later on. But this work being done is what we're going to be referring to as wattage say, in our modules. So I'll go through and I'll, I'll show you pictures of this water. Example, if you took a water tank and you open the valve and the water would flow because the weight or the pressure of the water in the tank. Okay? Now if the tank was raised to the roof and the spout removed on the ground, you would have more pressure because it's higher, see? And we run this water through pipes to keep it from leaking. And it's the same way we do with insulation. We put insulation, as we said earlier, around our electrical wire because we don't want the electricity to leak out. Okay? Now, you could stop a, a water leak. Say you had a small water leak and, and you just put your finger on it and to contain the leak. Well, with electricity, you would have to use an insulator. Say, like uh, we, what we use today on our wire is plastic. Years ago, we used rubber, or sometimes you'll hear say, put down dry wood or glass or different types that actually block the flow of electrons. It's called an insulator. Now, ampers is the amount of water flowing out of the pipe from the tank. Of course, this flow is decided by the size of the pipe, uh, the pressure. See, that pipe is what we call the friction or resistance. See, if this tank had two pipes, the water would discharge much faster as the restriction or the resistance is less. Now, water flows in a hollow pipe as it takes up space. It's a liquid. Put water through a hollow pipe. But see, electricity does not take up any space. Electricity can actually flow right through a solid wire. But the wire has resistance. Now, see, Emptying the tank, 
if you took a water tank and say you just dumped that tank over on its side, well, there is no resistance. And this is called a short circuit. You dump all the water. Now, to keep the tank full of water, to keep the water flowing continually, you'd need a water pump. Well, see, with electricity, we call this a generator, to where we keep filling that tank so all day long we have electricity. We call voltage pressure. Well, see, if we had too much water pressure, this is causes heat. The water will heat up. If a wire has too much pressure, too high a pressure or current, the wire can become hot, uh, even to the point I've seen wires melt from excessive heat. See, wire has resistance. And we'll learn in our next module more about this, but as the, as the wire gets bigger, it's just like the water pipe. As that gets bigger, it'll flow cool. It'll let it go. But as I bring that pipe or wire down smaller, then the resistance becomes higher. And that's where we run into the heat problem, say. Now with the paddle wheel. Now as you can see with the paddle wheel, the opposition as it's coming down is going to turn this wheel. Well see, the wheel offers opposition to the water coming. This is work, work being done. Electrically, we're going to call this watts. Okay. Example, in, in your house right now or wherever you're watching this video, say you had a table lamp that had a 100 watt light bulb. And that light bulb, you have 120 volts. But that light bulb and the filament of it, that filament has a resistance. And as I push that pressure, of 120 volts through that resistance, the work being done to make that light is called the 100 watts. Now, to sum this video up, E1, this is your inaugural video and your training to learn to be a, an electrician. And it's such a very important video because it's the inaugural to get you started off on the right foot. Well, see in this video, We've learned words like atom, molecule, electron, the forms of energy from friction to static to chemical to magnetism. Now we're talking about words like volts, amps, resistance, watts. These are words that you'll use throughout your electrical career. That's why it's so important to get started off right now with electron theory. See, in this electron theory, you're learning why. We're starting right there at the matter of it, at the atoms, so that you'll know why. You see, in my travels now, I've taught, oh, over 16,000 electricians. And see, I know what they know, and I know what a lot of them don't know. And see, a lot of them don't know the whys. The example We'll learn in wiring methods, when we put an aluminum conductor to a copper conductor, that we use an inhibitor, and this stops this electrolysis. Those guys out on the job, they know to put this inhibitor on. But see you, learning the whys at the inaugural video, you know why. Because copper has 29 atoms, where aluminum has 13 atoms. And this is a flow of current, as we saw in our demonstrations, from the copper to the aluminum. We have this flow. It's actually a heat transfer. It's like, it's like this book I have laid on my desk, this old book, and you can see how the, the pages are starting to yellow. And the reason is, is because of the oxygen that we have in this room and the atoms that's in this paper, one transfer of atoms to another. It's actually a burning process. It's heat. So these are the things that we have learned in E1. And we're going to move on through our other modules and we'll learn what an exciting experience this is, the electrical industry, and you to be a part of it. Now this concludes module E1. What I want you to do is to get your textbook now, module E1, 
and you read the textbook, and you read it slow, and you read it carefully, and you go back over it until you thoroughly understand it. And you can watch this video again. You can rewind this video and do it again. And you read that text, and then you work that examination. And what we're going for is 100%. We want to make sure in this business that we do it right. And I'll see you in Module E2. When in the Orlando area, come by and visit our electrician store, or you can visit by going online at our website, code-electrical. Our facility is located on two and one-half acres, which includes a bookstore, a classroom, and a filming studio with other buildings. Great gifts for the electrical person. Birthday, anniversary, Christmas time, or maybe someone's graduating from an apprenticeship, or they could be passing the electrical license exam. And don't forget the boss. Ohm's Law Products. Show them you're an electrician with the Ohm's Law electrician cap. We also have watches, wall clocks, belt buckles, key rings, sew-on patch, license plate, etc. Belt buckles and key rings for the electrician. Give the most precious gift of all, education, a gift that lasts a lifetime. This is my program, the Learn to Be an Electrician program, and I'm proud to say we have students enrolled from all 50 states and several countries. I'm sharing over 45 years of electrical knowledge with you in these 10 modules. I've written over 40 books. Go to our website, which you can view all of our products and for discount prices on Tom Henry books. The Informer Newsletter is a bi-monthly newsletter for the electrician. It was first published in 1998, so we have over 10 years now. We have editors from Texas, Indiana, New York, Ohio, North Carolina, Kansas, Arizona, Florida, etc. We're covering all phases of the electrical industry. The issue on the right, you can see, is the environment. This is what we're talking about today that we're concerned with. Now, the issue on the left is from the year 2000, when I signed a contract in Manila, in the Philippines, with a national bookstore to distribute my books throughout Asia. You see, the electrical trade has taken my journey from my birthplace in Bell Fountain, Ohio, to Disney World, to teaching in Honolulu, Hawaii, to speaking in Manila, to teaching in 21 states, to over 4 million miles in the air. Follow along my journey as well as the other consulting editors with the Informer newsletter. If you call our 800 number Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., or Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., that's Eastern Time, you will actually talk to a person. By using your Master Visa card, your order will be shipped the same day, UPS.